Once again, once again, my good friend, this is Doc Ock at noon and nine coming at you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central here in the Tree City, Kent, Ohio. The only state in the union that starts the same way it ends with a great big, big fat zero. Not because nothing happens here, but because Ohio is the heart of it all. It's right in the center of the action. If you don't know Ohio, you don't know the USA. So we're going to give you a little bit more knowledge that you didn't get in college about the USA today. Starting with the place that you need to be all the time. Subscribed to the Tubular Black Facts channel. Please go ahead and subscribe today. If you haven't done it already, you need to do it anyway. It's easy to do. It costs you nothing. All you do is just hit one button. Meanwhile, let's go ahead and share some words of wisdom with you from Dr. Edward W. Crosby, father of Black History Month. Now, this is one that I used to hear this one quite a bit as a child, that a hard head makes for a soft ass. Hard head makes for a soft ass. So some of you young folks out there might just want to keep that in mind. Might Maybe it might just save your behind. Who knows? Meanwhile, let's see what we got here for a um, poem today. From the mind of Mr. Eugene B. Redmond. Let's see what Redmond has to say today. Okay. Yeah, let's try this one here. This one sounds good. Looks like a good one. Right up my alley, Sally. This one is called a natal song. The outward landscape scars often scissors and sizzles the insides, but beneath the tough hide of race and self-pride, we contained the pain, quiet fingering the refrain, sandpaper rubbing my dream, steadfast in a grittier grip, tightening the intestinal nuts and bolts, growing with outward and with upward, yet with inward like air and chin hairs, to self-sunken sage of memory, those recomings that tranquilize, soothe and sandpaper the mind. The country in embryo burns in us, burns us, is scalding liquid and red hot poker-like lance. This nation nodding, gnashing of the belly is drum hum hard, ulcer knotted, yet fist coiled, is rock quarry in earth quick flesh. Rock people, tree true, carrying carcass and country. No vein and landle song. Oh, no vein and landless song. No vein and landless song. Now that was an interesting one he ended it with right there because I almost flubbed the dub there. That one was a little difficult to read. I wanted to say it some other kind of way. But that's some of the um, ins and outs of poetry by Mr. Eugene Redmond. He always puts in some of those twists and turns that sometimes burn, but always leave you with something that you now have earned because you will have grown within your mind in a way that is definitely the right kind, and you will do it every single time you read one of Eugene B. Redmond's poems, if you understand what I mean. Yes, sometimes I just have to do it off the cuff, but I'm not going to be doing it in the buff today, but I'm not, I will not give you any guff, nor will I give you any bluff. Meanwhile, let's move on to our main story for the day. The story of Dr. Edward W. Crosby as told by none other than himself. So 
we're going to go right back into the uh, book, his book, uh, Doing It the Hard Way, Reflections on My Life and Work. Right. My man wanted to, my dad wanted to reflect on all the things that he'd done in his life, all the good he tried to do, and maybe even some of the things that he did that weren't so good. Uh, we heard about those a little bit earlier on. So right now, he's in Akron, Ohio, and he's dealing with these, uh, well, now, he, he had segued from Akron all the way up in time to Kent in the 1970s, where he was dealing with model cities, which reminded him of earlier times when he was in Akron dealing with the Community Action Council. So he's comparing these two scenarios. I did not offer this scenario to suggest that all government-funded programs functioned this way. I am suggesting, however, that some of these programs that were originated and controlled by city governments during the 1970s were corrupt and or were controlled by those same moneyed interests that profited from urban poverty and squalor. Just think about it. Has anything really positive accrued to the reduction of poverty or the structural blight of housing in either Cleveland or Akron or anywhere else for that matter? that can be attributed to either of these programs. I have pointed to the above. Or have poor people, again, been relegated to get the proverbial shaft while white landowners and a limited number of white or black others got away with the dough? Mrs. Cassandra Gatlin Andrus died on September 23, 1988, sometime after she had married. Unfortunately, with her death, we lost a true anti-poverty warrior. May God bless and keep her. After trying to wage a feckless war on poverty for six months myself and contemplating returning to Hiram College, I was called by a good friend and former classmate at Kent State, Mr. Dr. Donald M. Henderson. He had previously taught sociology at Akron while I was teaching at Hiram. Akron U at the time was still a municipal college. He, like me, had joined the war on poverty. However, he held the directorship of the Washington DC based United Planning Organization. Henderson asked me if I'd be interested in joining him in an educational program for African-American college students. He and a colleague of his were preparing to start on Southern Illinois University's East St. Louis campus. I told Donald I was just contemplating leaving my current position in Akron's Community Action Council after six months and considering returning to Hiram. I also told him I'd be interested in obtaining some written information about this program he was involved with. Then he told me the Joint Southern Illinois University and Office of Employment Opportunity funded program was still unorganized. Staff had not yet been selected, so staff positions were still open. Then he told me the name of this new venture, the Experiment in Higher Education otherwise known as EHE, that's how we like to call it. When we finished discussing the need for programs like the one he had scantily described, our dis discussion turned first to my surprise over ha his having left Akron U and now working and living in DC. Then before we hung up, he asked me again about my interest in the experiment. And I told him I was. With that agreed to, I perforce, perforce had to tell him that I had some qualms, some misgivings about joining another anti-poverty program. I had just been burned 
by Akron's ineffective attempt after only six months. And I would hope this venture wouldn't come to a similar end. He told me he wouldn't have associated himself with the program if he were skeptical of its intent and its promoter, Hyman Frankel. With that said, he asked again whether I was going to join him. This time I answered emphatically, yes. He then told me to expect a call soon from Dr. Hyman Frankel, who had drafted the program's proposal and won the initial four-year grant of $400,000 for each of the initial four years. The program was also awarded a similar but currently undisclosed amount from Southern Illinois University. However, I did learn SIU would support the student's tuition costs and other necessities. He went on to, to on repeating, Frankel would set up a time and place for me to be interviewed. I got a call from Frankel the next day. He had set up a time and place for my interview to be held at Howard University and requested my curriculum veto. When we met, he informed me he had studied my vita, asked me a few questions about items in it, and then turned to a letter he had received from someone in Akron advising SIU not to hire me. <laughs> um, because I was a follower of Malcolm X's ideas. Hmm, how about that? We laughed, for that information happened to endorse my being hired rather than scuttling it. Then Dr. Franklin, or excuse me, Dr. Frankel offered his thoughts about education and especially about the education of poor white and black students. He put his emphasis on those ideas I had also harbored on educating black young people. Indeed, these ideas also defined what was lacking in the education received by white students as well. I told him about my experiences at John Adams High School, where I first encountered problems. I explained I had problems attending school regularly, and I attended, I tended toward placing those problems entirely on myself. Why? Because I knew I was not supposed to relate to being schooled like I was. Something must also be wrong with the way it was being delivered. It was not reaching me and a large number of those who associated with me. When I had entered a public school, a public high school that had been formerly all white and was at the time being quote unquote invaded by black students whose parents had become economically stronger, sought better living conditions and obtained housing in a community that was turning over rapidly, the influx that ensued placed considerable economic stress on the middle-income whites living in this turning-over community, on their children, as well as on the black children who had to attend school with them. The animosities that erupted between these two groups of students were hard to solve because the adult administrative and instructional staff, the problem solvers, were also stressed out, not knowing what to do the administrators of these schools could offer no possible reliable remedy. The influx of black youth was almost akin to an invasion. Yes, it was quote unquote an alien invasion. Only this time it was African-American youth rather than Martians. I could have gone on. However, Dr. Frankel interrupted me, agreed with my point of view and began querying me on my views of higher ed. I told him I had not given that much thought until I was hired at Hiram and had been placed in a situation that embodied ed educational innovation. Then I brought up my being asked to team teach Hiram's capstone course. That introduced me to educational holism. Once I had brought up that experience with holism on the college level, he understood I had begun to embrace educational theories that he held. The interview terminated with Dr. Frankel thanking me for my candor and telling me he would be getting back to me soon. If I had any uncertainties about the experiment, quote unquote, 
They vanished during my interview in D.C. at Howard University. Even though I may have harbored some reluctance toward Dr. Frankel's offer in the beginning, after the interview, I felt much more comfortable being in on the ground floor and working with him and my former Kent State classmate, with whom I was very familiar and knew I would be able to work with. The only unknowns being Dr. Frankel's cadre of white consultants, many of whom I had anticipated had a connection with OEO, or the Office of Economic Opportunity as it was known, the same outfit I had jaundiced ideas about when I was working in Akron. The difference, I was informed, was once we were in East St. Louis, we would be working under the aegis of Southern Illinois University and its chosen administrative staff. The experiment's administrative staff would be Dr. Frankel as executive director, uh, the very good friend of mine, Dr. Donald M. Henderson, would be the deputy director, Mr. Harold Cohen, director of education, and myself, director of teacher counselors. Moreover, the primary funder of $400,000 of $400, for each of four years was OEO. This funding supported all administrative and educational costs. A co-sponsor was the University of Southern Illinois at Edwardsville, which contributed its administrative structure. SIU Carbondale contributed sizable financial support, most of which I learned would guarantee EHE's 200 students full scholarships, assuring the program's successful students the financial wherewithal needed to continue studying at SIU for their final junior and senior years. If students chose to attend some other university, the uh, experiment's director of education would, in concert with EHE's other administrators, have the task of soliciting their funding from the universities they chose to attend, from foundations or other lending institutions around the country. Within a week or two, I received a letter from Frankel welcoming me to the experiment in higher education team and the program planning conference that was scheduled for June or July 1966 in East St. Louis. Invited to the several planning sessions were Dr. Hyman Frankel uh, in sociology, Southern Illinois University, Dr. Donald Henderson, also sociology for the United Planning Organization in DC, and Edward W. Crosby, foreign languages from Hiram, and Dr. Norman Johnson, sociology for du from Duquesne University. Also, Harold Cohen, Paul Welcher, two OEO staff members and officials from the East St. Louis Public Schools. And we're going to end this right about there. And we'll return to this since today being Friday, we won't return until moon day. So we'll return to this then. But this is actually getting into, even though it seems kind of dry right now, this is getting into a very interesting part of Dr. Crosby's career because EHE was turned out to be like a, a crucible, okay? It was like a crucible. His metal got tempered at EHE, put it that way. So we'll see how that happens uh, in our upcoming readings starting uh, next week. For this weekend, go ahead and look for our our two uh, playlists. One of them is going to be is called Real Talk, and the other one is called from the um, from the Book of Crosby. So those will be coming out on Saturday and Sunday. One for the noontime um, program will be on Saturday. The one for the uh, evening program will be on Sunday, and we'll be bringing in some additional uh, videos. Uh, pers perspectives from other people, as well as doing a replay of anything that you might have missed during the week. So, there you have it in a nutshell. From the pen, from the mind and the pen of Dr. Edward W. Crosby, we're bringing it to you live and direct, his story according to him. And we'll talk more about that later because we're also verifying. We trust, but we verify. 
So we, we've talked to many other people to verify m much of what Dr. Crosby has said in his autobiography. Meanwhile, you know what you need to do. If you haven't done it already, it's time to go ahead and drop it right about now. Subscribe to the Tubular Black Facts channel. If you already subscribed, consider making a donation. We need donations in order for us to continue this project because it is not a vacation. This is a vocation. We're doing this pretty much full time now, along with some other projects related to the life of Dr. Crosby, as well as trying to establish here in Kent, Ohio, a black archive bar none for the state of Ohio, because right now we're insufficient. What we have right now is definitely insufficient. We're losing more than we're saving. So in the meanwhile, peace out without a doubt, with plenty of justice, because anything less disgust us, and you know you don't want to see us being disgusted, because it's not a pretty sight. Other than that, oh, let me go ahead and give a shout out to Sydney Harris. We see you out there, Sydney, and I see Sterling James over there. Good looking out, and Connie Moreland. How you doing, Connie? All right. So shout out to everybody else that's, that's been watching. Keep your eyes peeled because we're going to be bringing you the real. Matter of fact, tonight we'll be bringing you more real talk.